Loops in PCG are quite important to actually accomplishing many things, but one aspect of them, the feedback part of it, can be quite confusing. Unlike regular blueprint loops, they work a little bit differently. So let me explain exactly how they work and how to set up a few different scenarios, including a simple a for each loop with break, so you can stop a loop in the middle of whenever you need to, as well as being able to use a feedback loop to kind of send information and compile information on each pass to get an exponential result because of it. So with that, let's get right into it. To get started, make sure you have PC turned on. If you go to edit plugins, search for PCG and make sure your procedural continuation framework is turned on and if you need to restart your engine. Once you've restarted, we can go ahead and create our PCG graph. So go ahead and right click, grab your PCG graph from your PCG section. And this is just gonna be our PCG base graph. And immediately I'm just going to duplicate it and create one more graph. And this is going to be our loop graph. So it's gonna be our PCG for each with break. These are gonna be our two graphs we're gonna be using for this setup. Take this PCG base graph, I'll drag it out here. So we have something in the world and we can use this volume as our base. Let's open it up. So we can move the output out of the way. We're gonna use the in, and we're gonna take the in and grab ourselves a volume sampler. And this is, we're gonna set it to be something like 500, 500, 500 for the voxel size. This gets me 400 points in the default volume. You see it's all fully dense. To make it a little easier for ourselves to see it, I'm gonna use an extents modifier and I'm gonna set the extents modifier to multiply and the extents to 0.5 on all three axes. And now if I go ahead and sample this with a D key, you can see we now have a much easier time seeing the individual cubes that it outputs. So now how do we do a for each loop with break? Basically we set up a regular loop and then implement the feedback mechanic. So for that, I'll go ahead and open this PCG loop with break that I created. For the input, I have a simple point loop that is set to required and our output has just a point normal set to pin status normal, but this doesn't have our loop actually. So if I go ahead and just pipe that all the way through, we can start using this just to see that the points are going through and everything's fine. Back in our base graph, what we need to use is a attribute partition because we want to partition all the points and split it up so it actually does all of them in the loop. And we're going to partition them by index so it does every single one as it goes through. Then I'm going to right click and search for loop and I'll pipe in our loop that we have created right in here and plug that all the way through. And at the end here, I'll drag out and just search for debug. And that just goes ahead and debugs the points that are coming out at the end. And if we take a look, you can see we have all of our points making it all the way to the end. But now let's say we want to keep a certain amount of them. So we want to go through the entire loop, but when a certain condition is met, we stop. In this case, I'm going to set it up where it's basically the index. When the index, let's say hits 100, stop. Don't do anything after that, pretty much. The first 100 points, do the loop as you would. So in our for each loop section, we need something else on the input and output, and that's the feedback. So I'm gonna add a new pin. The usage will be set to feedback and the allowed type will be set to attribute set. And I'll change the pin status to required. Now this is important. The label here matters. So where normally you could just call it whatever you want. You could even leave it like in, in one, in two. In feedback, it actually matters what the, you call the label because the input and the output both need a feedback and they both need to be called the same thing. So to make it easy, I'm gonna call the label feedback. So it's gonna be a label feedback, usage feedback of an attribute set that is required. And then for the output, I'll add a new output pin, call it the same thing, feedback of type feedback, allow type attribute set, set to normal. So great, so now this is working. And if we come out here, it has disabled the loop because we have nothing piped into the feedback. So I'll go ahead and use a create attribute here. And I'll pipe something in, just a value of zero. Now, originally I tried to set this up with a Boolean, so that way I can set it to be false or true depending on the condition. But for some reason I cannot set a Boolean attribute, but I can modify a number which effectively gets the same result, zero being false and one being true. So in this scenario, we're starting out with zero being false as our default. So over here, what we can do is search for a branch node, we'll open it up and we're gonna pipe in our endpoints into this branch and out A will go into our output and the feedback is going to go to output to B. So as long as it is false, it will continue doing A. And we can see that we have all our points here. And if I change this number here to one, the first point has disappeared. Well, that's odd. Why is only the first point disappear? Why haven't all of them disappeared? Well, that's how the feedback loops work. We have nothing piped in here. So it's not actually taking the what's piped in, it's taking what's piped out. 
The way it works is the first thing it does grabs from here and every index afterwards, it grabs it from here. But we have nothing piped in here and it defaults it to false. So it goes into output A and outputs it as normal because we have nothing plugged in. If I go ahead and use a create attribute here and I change this to one as well, then our entire thing has disappeared because the first one gets our information from here and every loop after that gets the information from this because that's what we're passing through on loop two. It goes all the way through, takes the feedback, puts it through. Imagine just a loop that just goes from this feedback loop back around and into the start one on every single iteration. So great. So now how do we control it to make it a for each loop knowing this? Well, to do that, I'm going to use a get loop index to find out what our index is. I use the get loop index. I check if it is equal to a CERN index. So using a create attribute again, I'll set it to something like 10 and plug this in. Now keep in mind that this is not 10 objects, this is 11, because the loop starts at zero, not at one. So if you want to specifically specify an exact number here, you would need to do the number minus one. So now that we have the condition, we can select based on the condition. And we can do that using a simple select node. Now, keep in mind that if you were to drag out of this feedback node and then search for select and use that, it will get you this conversion because at the current moment, this is a wildcard. So it's converted from wildcard to attribute. So don't drag out of it. Or if you do, just detach it and then use this. We don't need the conversion because once it realizes what type it is, it's going to be just fine. So we're going to select it based off of this equal sign. So if it is equal to the loop index that we want, then we're going to be using B. And when we do that, we want to use a create attribute. We want to set the value to be true. So we're going to set it to be one. We're going to pipe it into B. So as soon as it's allowed to, it will pipe into B. Otherwise, we can go ahead and just reuse what we had before. We can just take the feedback loop and pipe it in. And then we take this and pipe it into our feedback out. So it's going to take our original value of zero. It's going to check, hey, is the loop index equal to 10? No, go ahead and just pass that zero along. If it is, pass it to one. And eventually, once it gets to this to being true, it will set it to be one. And then it'll come here and say, hey, is it equal to one? Uh, one? No? Well, that's fine. Pass it through, but it's already been set to one. Now you could do this a few different ways, right? But you can see kind of how this is set up. So back in our original graph, I'm going to make sure their create attribute here by default is zero. And if we look at our debug points, you can see that we now have 11 points right here in the scene. 10 wide and one extra one. Because like I said, it's grabbing one extra one from here. And if I want to change it, I can go ahead and modify this number. Let's say 50. And again, now we're getting 51 points here. Now you don't have to pipe the feedback loop in, in this scenario. One alternative would be to just use a create attribute here, a second one, the default here being zero. We're going to let things through. Instead of equal, we're going to change it to be greater or equal. And then I'll pipe that into B. And you can see we get the exact same result. So in this scenario, we're not taking the feedback loop and actually reusing it. We're just replacing the feedback loop on every attempt after the first using this conditional. And the next time it goes through, it checks that conditional. I'm like, okay, is it true or false? And then outputs it. As always, the project files for this are going to be available on my Patreon. We can join these wonderful people here in supporting what I do. It really means a lot. And if you'd like to join the community, the link to the Discord is down below as always. You can get to the patrons. Let's get back to it. So this was a for each loop with break, but now how do we actually start using it and combining it and utilizing the feedback loop onto itself in kind of an exponential manner? All for that, I'm going to duplicate the base graph. I'm going to call it just base graph exponential. I'm going to duplicate our loop. And instead of calling it for each with break, I'll call it exponential. Then we can have both of these in the level by dragging this one to the side and dragging this one out. Now it's exactly the same because we haven't configured it, but let's go ahead and do that. I'll open up the PCG base graph exponential as well as the PCG loop exponential. So for the new base graph exponential, the main thing we're going to be changing here is this loop. We're going to swap it out for the exponential loop and then go ahead and open it up. Now I've basically deleted everything here except the get loop index in case we need it and the input and output. The reason I duplicated it was just to get the input and output and the feedback loop just automatically set up since we already had a nice template from the previous one. So effectively what I want to do is take our current offset and double it every time. So if it's offset by one, the next time will be two, four, eight, 16, etc. So for that, we just need a transform points right in between these two nodes. And in the transform points, we need a vector. So I'm going to right click and search for make vector attribute. We're going to change the output type to be vector type three, and we're going to plug that into offset min and max. And now we take our feedback loop and we just need to multiply it by a value. I'll use a create attribute. This is going to be a value of two. So it's going to multiply it by two every single time. 
and we're going to offset the point by whatever the feedback was times two. Now we want to make sure that we're outputting this same value out to the feedback. So again, if this was then two, it'll output two, and next time around, it'll multiply by two again, it'll be four, et cetera. Now, if we take a look, nothing has changed. And why has nothing changed? Well, that's because we're still using zero here on our input. If I change this to something like one, you will immediately see we now get a curve where it is doubling every time as it goes along. Now, now because the points are in a grid like this, it's hard to tell. So what I'm gonna do is take our points, I'm gonna just shrink it in so we just get a single line and spread it out a bit more so you can really see the curve here as it gets doubled. Now, if you don't want this to go up quite as much, you go ahead and change this to be something 0.1. So let's start with 0.1, it'll be a little more gradual as it goes. Now, if I wanted to, I could use this get loop index to modify that starting point because the starting point also gets doubled and offset. But similar to the previous version, if I want to, I could use the get loop index, check if it is equal to the first point, and if it is, just go ahead and output zero, otherwise, continue to double. Just keep in mind that if you're outputting zero on the first point, you'll seem to change the output because if it outputs zero, well then zero times two will still say zero and it'll forever be zero. So whereas you'd want to modify the transform points, you'd still want to output the correct information or something like the alternative could be to just offset everything just back down a little bit by that first amount. But that's all going to depend on your use case. As you see, we're using quite small values to get a nice gradual ramp up. So if those values are small enough that might be completely fine to you. And if we want to, instead of multiplying by two, we can absolutely change this to be like 1.25. And you can see it is just a very gradual uphill. Change it to something like, again, 1.5. It gets, well, significantly faster going up. So you have full control now. Basically take feedback, modify it, use it any way you want, send it out and grab it from the start and start stacking information on top of itself. And you can use multiple feedbacks in your input and output as long as they match. So you can send a bunch of different information through the individual inputs and outputs, or you can all combine it together into one and split it up at the start and recombine it at the end. It's entirely up to you. But hopefully this has cleared up the feedback loops to you so you can start using it and incorporating it into your loops and your BCG and making it just that much more complex and more interesting as you continue creating new stuff. Now, if loops themselves could still confuse you and how that is all still set up, you can check out this video right here where I go over the basics of PCG loops that were changed since 5.4.